You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bors Puya. In this week's program, we'll interview Nawal Saddavi, Egyptian writer and women's rights activist. Yeah, and we have lots of interesting things to discuss, including the arrest of poet and singer Yahma Golrui in Iran, the refusal of the Tehran Symphony to play when women uh, uh, performers were banned. We'll also talk about the burning of the ISIS flag by Kurdish fighters in Sinjar, a fatwa on adultery if you enter the sea, as well as the incident at Goldsmith University with the Islamic society there. It's going to be an interesting program. Don't go away. In the week that's passed, we have uh, some issues that we'd like to discuss with you. Of course, the first one I think that's quite important is the fact that there's this wonderful poet and singer called Yagma Golrui, who was arrested on Monday, the 28th of November. Uh, the security agents entered his home, took him away, and his wife has reported on Facebook that his whereabouts are unknown. Yeah, and he's one of the Iranian well-known um, um, singer and songwriter. Um, his most recent um, video was dedicated to Iranian women for the fight to, for liberty and equality between men and women. It's quite a beautiful video as well. Yeah, we're going to show you a, a short clip of this video. Um, it's, it's just fantastic. If you haven't seen it, you're going to be blown away. Stay and watch this with us. شاد و خندونیم با این که توی زندونیم راه ما بسته پای ما خسته اما آتیش می سوزونیم ما نسل پر فریادیم دستامونو به هم دادیم قرقه خونیم اما می دونیم آخر قصه آزادیم زندونیم دیگه اینجا نمیمونیم پنجره میشیم پنجره میشیم شعر رهایی میخونیم با نسل پر فریادیم دستامونو به هم دادیم قربه خونیم اما میدونیم آخر قصه Oh, 
I hope you enjoyed that video. I mean, I, I, I think the lyrics in that song is so wonderful. You know, the part where he says, you know, you, you, people who are drowned in blood, who have been a generation of screams, and nonetheless, we know at the end of this story, which means at the end of this fight, that we are all going to be free. And I think it's just, it, it does the, represent the it women's captures, liberation movement. It captures the, the history of the um, undefeated in Iran, I think. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And of course, this leads us to um, the fact that, you know, the fight for women's liberation in Iran is a very important fight. It's one of the fights that is challenging the Iranian regime to its core, as I think women's rights issues challenge Islamists in general to their core because they're so misogynist. And there's this wonderful story of the Tehran Symphony <coughs> Orchestra. They were meant to be playing at the wrestling, international wrestling event. And uh, uh, the Islamic regime um, agents came and said, look, you can't perform because you have women in your group and uh, you, they need to go and only men, men only sort of orchestra can, can play. Yeah, and what was great is that they said that you can play, but without the women members. Yes. And they said, no, yeah, absolutely. we're the, not the, performing the, yeah. without our women the members. The conductor said we have yes. to be together and yeah. actually they all left and they did not play. They've naturally written recently to the Ministry of Guide, Islamic Guidance, mm -hmm. who's very much uh, related to uh, the minister, he's the son of one of the Ayatollahs, um, and they've complained about this. <coughs> and it's interesting because um, Ali Rahbari, who is the artistic director, he was the one who cancelled it. Uh, but of course the wrestling um, federation there had said that this is not something that we wanted and they re-invited them back to another event. So it, again it shows you know, this fight between the Iranian regime against women. Uh, and uh, they also accused the women of not being properly veiled. That was another That's one excuse. of the ac accusations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And w what's interesting about all of this is when you look at a situation like in Iran where there is this constant battle back and forth between the regime and between people who are demanding equality, who, want, who don't want segregation and so on and so forth, you look at that situation and then you come and see a similar situation in a fight, let's say, with Islamists here at universities. And then you find that, you know, there are people who are defending gender segregation and would call that artistic director Islamophobic, most probably, saying that he hasn't respected Actually, uh, uh, Islamic uh, culture. Uh, yeah, majority <laughs> of Iranian people and Middle East would be Islamophobic because actually they despise uh, the Islamists. They despise them. They're, they're, it's not just they're, they're critical, they despise the Islamists. So I guess if you want to sort of define base yeah. on the current definition of use of Islamophobia in Europe and in England, majority of people in Iran, in Iraq, in, you know, in Turkey, you know, they are Islamophobic. Yeah, and, and of course by this term it's often conflated with bigotry against people, but obviously, um, you know, Islam is not a people, it's, it's an idea and therefore it should be open to criticism. And we see that <coughs> a lot in the debate around what happened at my talk at Goldsmiths uh, University, where the Islamic Society came and tried to disrupt it. I think one of the things that um, you know, astonishes me is that a lot of people will look at that video and, and think that a terrible thing happened, uh, but will look at those Islamists as children who are to throwing a tantrum and just making a big fuss and they should sit down and learn, you know, some manners. They don't see how that Islamic society members are linked to a larger political movement. Absolutely, and this is part and parcel of the um, Islamic movement. Um, being abusive. Uh, um, if they're in, in power, forget about being abusive. They actually change the rules and um, they impose the bill on, major the, on, on society. When they're not in power, according to the power, uh, a strength <coughs> they have, they'll try to enforce in a sort of, in a different way. And this is part of DNA of the Islamic uh, uh, movement and the Islamist, political Islamic movement. Uh, the, it's not an incident. It's, it, it's the rule of the Islamist. Uh, it's not a few create. rotten apples, basically. Absolutely the whole movement is yeah. rotten to its core. And it needs to be challenged. Can I just say, <coughs> um, thanks to you and uh, um, other people who were there, they were challenged and they, they were not allowed to speak, uh, to disrupt the meeting, and they failed. And um, these are usually cowards. When you challenge them, they retreat. And it's important for 
people to recognize that there must be challenge, you know, in a civilized way, of course, um, you know, but there must be challenge. We, sh we cannot allow the Islamists to rule the universities and the rest of the society. The challenge is important. I think yeah, I think also what's important is to note that when they are in power, like in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, in Nigeria, wherever, that whatever sections of the country or, or the entire country that they have power, they do actually use violence and force. And here, oftentimes, you know, they are part of that same movement. They might not be able to use violence to that extent. They often use rights language like safe spaces and, you know, uh, the right not to feel discriminated against. But even at that Goldsmiths University meeting, we saw, you know, one of the Islamists threatened uh, one of the participants there, Reza Moradi, and also, you know, uh, laughed, for example, when I spoke about um, Bangladeshi bloggers being hacked to death. I mean, this is, you know, I think it's a grave mistake if we don't recognize that uh, many Islamic societies, I would venture to say maybe all of them, are linked to the Islamist movement and we need to recognize that. If we don't recognize that this is linked to Islamism, it's gonna, we're going to fail in diagnosing and addressing the problem. I mean, it might be interesting to have a specific program later on on, on the whole issue of uh, um, Islamism, uh, which is a really fascist movement on the uh, campus in Europe and America. Yeah, but before we finish uh, this segment, I do want to say one thing, uh, that despite evidence, video evidence, uh, on what the Islamic society did at my meeting, trying to intimidate, trying to harass, trying to create a climate of fear, Goldsmiths University's uh, feminist society and its LGBTQ plus society have stated, uh, uh, given out statements in solidarity with the Islamic society. So, you know, when we talk about a politics of betrayal, this is exactly it. So, you know, in Iran, for example, you've got Yagma Golrui singing for women's rights, the Tehran Orchestra refusing to play without their women members, but the feminist society at Goldsmiths and its LGBTQ plus group side with the fascists against dissenters. How outrageous can this be? I, you know, it's, I, I'm speechless, uh, more so about this than about how the Islamists behave, because I don't expect anything better from the Islamists. Sure. Yeah. Um, but and I also want to just say one more thing is about BBC Trending. You know, the, the BBC Trending did a program on ex-Muslims, and again, they framed an entire trending issue that has taken inspired people and allowed ex-Muslims to come out in their masses to say why they've left Islam. Inspiring stories, heartwarming stories, they've basically framed it within the context of Islamophobia. It's part of the establishment's effort to silence dissent and to give access to large segments of the Islamists, whether it's the Saudi government that they're involved with or, um, you know, the soft Islamists that they're often appeasing day in and day out. And I think this is, you, you could see um, uh, the, Sla the, the um, um, Islamic societies are linked to Islamist movement and you, you, it, it's not difficult to see how they are linked to ISIS, the sections of it very actively. Um, there is, you know, all the charities that have been set up goes there. And that's a discussion we could have um, about the um, um, Islamic societies. But the reality is that organizations like Stop the War uh, type of um, feminist society that we have uh, seen in Goldsmiths, they are part and parcel of yeah, sorry, um, the whole uh, part gagged. of the whole movement, which is actually quite reactionary. They are. It's not that they don't understand. This is the reality of fascism and those who they're support collaborators. The collaborators, collaborators of fascism yeah. over this day over age. the dead bodies of generations of dissenters in the Middle East, North Africa and South Asia. How shameful. The insane fatwa of this week is from the Muslim Brotherhood and it was issued during Morsi's presidency. And it's about the fact that you could commit adultery if you enter the sea. How's that again? It only applies to women, not men, first of all. Of course. The, the second thing point is... Um, that Tell us I something have, we don't know. I had to go and <laughs> look at this properly and read it twice to find out that actually... Only twice? Twice. Wow. Also, you're you're brilliant. Kind of <laughs> so twice I had to read this and realize that sea in Arabic is male. So if women enter the sea, they've committed adultery. Up go. to the knee is okay. It's first base. Ankles are first base, second base. 
then if you go up your pelvic and that's it you've dangerous you're done don't go <laughs>
not violent, which is a big lie. They are very, very violent. And the Salafi are very violent. Because there is no religious fundamentalist group not violent. Look at the Jewish fundamentalism in Israel. Look what they are doing. So, uh, 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 there is a lot of deception. What's the solution, do you think? Do you think secularism is an important way? Uh, the solution? Yeah. Uh, uh, secular? Is, is secularism one solution? Be uh, uh, of course, part of it is secularism. But we need to change the mentality. Uh, the way we inherit religion, we become religious by inheritance. So we have to stop this mentality. We need a revolution, educational revolution. I'm for that. We need a revolution in education. We should stop religious education to children. What are the things that you think are important to do? Hmm? What, are the, what are the steps? Uh, one is uh, stopping religious education. What are the other things we can do to change things? Uh, yes, that we work together. And number one, to understand. We have to understand the roots because if we diagnose the problem well, then we can fight. Okay. But if we misdiagnose, then we, we, we do not do anything. So that's why I, am, I love very much radical feminism. We go to the roots. Class oppression, gender oppression, religious oppression, political, the global is local and all that. What do you think of uh, solutions within Islam, like Islamic feminism? I don't, I don't agree to that. This is hypocrisy and this is deception. And I don't think that, uh, because I spent 10 years of my life studying religion. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. So um, if you study religion, you, can, you cannot really have revolution within a religion unless you discard the books. You don't look at the books and then you could say God is a symbol of justice and you believe in the divine as justice. Because there are many people who do not believe in God of the book. But, but they say we believe that God is justice. Okay. But also, I question that. So I am very much, I, 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 I need clear, we need to be clear, not to deceive ourselves. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Nawal Sadawi. I mean, I think she raises some really important points. And one is the fact that, you know, it's not, issues are not country specific. They're issues that are international, that affect all of us. And that is especially true of many issues and also of Islamism. Absolutely. And it seems to me um, she refers to neo-colonialism. Neo, neo, uh, uh, neo yeah. um, I, I would look at it as a project of neoconservative sort of uh, policy of reshaping society. And one of the main tools is religion and establishment. You can see that both in Middle East very clearly, that they use Sunni and Shia. And you look at the Iraq, what they've done, they've actually the main... Uh, policy is spearheaded by the religious division and ethnic division. Yeah. I mean, that's very clear. I, I mean, when we look at the situation in Iraq, we have called it the Iraqization of the world, in a sense, where societies and countries are now not divided, not, you know, there are no more citizens, and that includes Britain, the West, Europe, uh, but they are communities, and, and pat particularly religious communities. And you can see how that's unfolding in Syria as well. Uh, so it's not incidental that the uh, closest friend of the neocon sort of policy internationally are Saudi Arabia on one hand, and on the other hand, you see Russia and Iran, the, the other side of the um, conflict. All of those agree internationally that societies need to be divided based ethnicity and religion. They're different, different part, different sections, and that reflects itself in domestic policies of restructuring the state in Europe as well and America. You'll see uh, again the creeping 
uh, sort of uh, increase in influence of the religious yeah. in institution, so public institutions. Yeah, and I mean, there's definitely, uh, you know, when you criticize religion, um, in let's say in Britain at Goldsmiths University, this is something that is actually anti-establishment to a large extent. It's not just anti-Islamist. And that's why there is very little capacity to hear this sort of criticism. Um, it, it's it's because it's going against the current. Absolutely. I mean, when you see, for example, BBC, when they, the way they sort of uh, um, treat the ex-Muslim sort of trending, this is establishment. Now, uh, uh, you know, discussing uh, the approach that the Islamists take in relation to Islamophobia is part and parcel of the administration of the state. Now they've started to collect statistics of various kind, and any discussion is labeled automatically as um, Islamophobic. And, and <coughs> this is an angle I think Nawal Sadavi picks up quite nicely in, 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 in the interview. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think, you know, the point which she makes about how if you can't diagnose, diagnose the problem correctly, you're not going to be, be able to reach a solution. And I think that's why it is hugely important to diagnose it correctly. And how, how key it is to also address the issue of religion. You know, she mentions the thing about how religion should not be by inheritance anymore. We see the Turkish uh, Atheist Society having called for an end to the automatic laboring of children the minute they're born as Muslims, uh, and also not having religious education and so on and so forth. So all of these are hugely crucial in the fight that we have ahead. The photo for the Slice of Life is what you're seeing right now. It is a wonderful photo of uh, Kurdish fighters who have kicked out ISIS from Sinjar and are now burning the ISIS flag. Oh, what a glorious photo this is. And this is sort of reflects you a couple of years ago in, uh, in Oxford. You turned up the, um, the flag of ISIS. Um, That's exactly what needs to be done with them. And I think yeah. this, this, this is the same thing. ISIS and the religious right flag um, needs to be wiped out, out of society. So it's not just the, the flag, it's the whole culture of misogyny needs to be challenged and wiped out. We hope you enjoyed this week's program as much as we enjoy bringing them to you. Until next week, have a wonderful week and see you then. Bye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, 
empowering a new generation of content creators.